tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about forest fables and evil entities. I'm your host, Steve Taylor. And tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Lindsay Goddard and Kendra Yvette are voice talents Kevin Barberry, Jeff Sturdivant, and Justine Anastasia. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our Theater of the Minds. And brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale this evening is written by Lindsay Goddard and performed by Kevin Barberry and Jeff Sturdivant. At the edge of an abandoned farm, two young men discuss the superstition tied to an eerie tree stump that appears to have the face of an old man. Legend goes, if you don't apologize to old man stump for gazing into his face, he will have revenge. Now, without further ado, I present to you, Old Man Stump. You weren't kidding, said Jordan. The tree stump was exactly as Adam had described. Blackened by fire, it poked from the ground at an odd angle that suggested its roots had long ago rotted. Inside the trunk, every knot, dip, and crevice worked together to create the illusion of an old man's face. Eyebrows slanted, eyes pinched shut. There were even frown lines in the bark around the slit of its mouth. Nope, Adam said. Wasn't kidding. From the creases in the forehead to the wrinkles around the lips, its features were so real, Jordan couldn't help but picture the eyes opening, exposing wormhole pupils. The sun shone over everything except for that dead tree trunk, which seemingly sat under the only patch of clouds. A chill ran up Jordan's spine. The old man was angry when he died, Adam explained wind ruffling his flaxen hair like wheat fields in the distance. His neighbor had insisted on cutting this tree down after a bolt of lightning struck it. It was dying, but the old man wouldn't remove it. It had been his late wife's tree, sentimental value, meant the world to him. So when outsiders tried to cut it down, the old man attempted to intervene, and the dying tree, damaged by the blade of the chainsaw, fell on top of him, killing the man. Adam glanced around the barren field, then at the boarded-up farmhouse. Now they call him Old Man Stump, and legend goes, if you look at him, you gotta say, Sorry, Old Man Stump, or he'll come and get you. Jordan rubbed his arms. He regretted not bringing a jacket. The sun had been shining all day, but now he couldn't feel its warmth. Let me get this straight. 
This moldy old tree stump will come and get me if I don't say sorry for looking at it? Uh Uh-huh. Why should I be sorry? I didn't do anything. Adam shrugged. I don't know, man. That's just the story. Jordan laughed, but the ground beneath his feet quaked, cutting him short. A soft rumbling sensation vibrated through the soles of his shoes. Below him, something moved through the dirt like restless roots squirming. He narrowed his eyes and forced another chuckle. Wow, man. You must get pretty bored around these parts to make up some stuff like that. Yeah, I guess so, Adam said. But as the boys turned and headed toward the car, Jordan heard Adam whisper, Sorry, old man, Stump. Jordan almost said it too. Superstition or not, it might relieve the tension in his gut. Yet, with a shake of his head, he swallowed the words on the tip of his tongue, unable to do it. Later that night, a tapping sound awakened him. Jordan gripped his sheets, hands trembling. He drew slow, shallow breaths, listening to the tap, tap, tap on his bedroom window. Let me in, the sound seemed to say. He covered his ears and closed his eyes. I'm sorry, old man Stump, he whimpered. There was a moment of silence before an onslaught of taps and scrapes. The window pane shattered, raining glass over his bed. He opened his eyes but saw no attacker, only a broken tree stump sitting in the dim moonlight. The smell of blackened wood filled his nostrils. Fresh branches sprouted from the old dead stump. They wiggled in the air like tentacles, growing thicker by the second, changing from green to brown. In mere seconds, there were dozens of them invading his room. They coiled around furniture, stretched across walls. They grew like ivy across the floor until they reached Jordan's bed. Framed by the glass of the broken window, the man in the tree stump watched as Jordan jumped to his feet, tossing his blanket onto a swarm of leafy tendrils. They ensnared him, pulled him down. Bark scraped his skin as old man Stump's branches climbed his body, dragging him across the floor as he struggled for escape. He turned to the monstrous face. The eyes were wide now, instead of pinched shut like before, and they were completely empty, just notches set deep in the wood. Jordan screamed and screamed. The stump's frown twisted into a grin. Its sinister appendages ripped Jordan apart and tossed him down its decrepit gullet piece by piece. Full and satisfied, old man stump returned home and forced himself into the dirt. He used his newly formed branches to dig holes and push soil over himself until his lower half was buried. The remaining roots burrowed like snakes into the ground where they reunited with broken fragments he had left behind. His new branches felt dry and rigid. Soon, they would die and crumble. It was the way of things. Old Man Stump was not a tree. Trees are alive. Old Man Stump was dead and hollow. Still, if he could shrug his shoulders, he would. He didn't mind that he would never live as a tree. He had lived a full life once before. It's just that he hadn't been ready to leave when his time had come, so he simply hadn't. Streaks of blood began to dry on his gnarled face. He ran a tongue like tree bark over the dark crimson stain and sighed. Those disrespectful kids were always disturbing his slumber, making him leave the soft comfort of the earth. But he didn't mind. Not really. He liked a good meal now and then. It made him feel less empty inside. Old Man Stump shed his branches and pinched his eyes shut. Donning a frown, he faded into slumber once more. I hope you enjoyed Old Man Stump, as written by Lindsay Goddard and performed by Kevin Barberi and Jeff Sturdivant. Our second tale of the evening is written by Kendra Yvette and performed by by Justine Anastasia. In it, there's an enigmatic force of evil that terrorizes families in a peculiar way. 
Awoken in the middle of the night, a protective mother of two finds herself desperate to keep her family safe from the terror that threatens it. Now, without further ado, I present to you, The Glass Man. A back in Andalusian, lightning cracks against the midnight sky. With the same shocking fervor, I awake with a start. The rush of adrenaline I feel contrasts the dizzy whirlpool in my barely awake brain. There are some things you immediately know upon an unexpected awakening, and there are some things you don't. I know the crack that jostled me awake was lightning, which means the pitter-patter beating on my roof must be rain. So what's the swishing, whistling sound that plays like whispers in my ears? I shut my eyes and strain against the rain and the dark to focus on my hearing. Through the black fog that still clouds my mind are whispers peeking through. They're bouncing through the hallway, rolling up the stairs, coming somewhere from the first floor. Just loud enough to know what's what, but not loud enough to know what's where. I rise slowly, so my mattress doesn't creak when I do so. I slink out of bed and put on my slippers. My silky nightgown feels cold against my skin and accentuates the goosebumps that have risen. I press my ear to my bedroom door and listen for the noise. Chitter-chatter, pitter-patter, whispers, as if glass could talk. The hair on my arm stands on end. I pray that it's Tyler. I never slept at 12 years old. I wanted to be up like the grown-ups were. He sneaks to the computer at night and looks up silly things like Bloody Mary or Slender Man, adolescent things to joke with his friends about. Or perhaps it's Skyla. She doesn't know that I know. She's taken up a habit of climbing out her window, shimmying down the drain pipe a few nights a week to see her boyfriend. Sure, as a mom I'm worried, but what else is being 17 for if not breaking a few rules? But the raised hairs and my quickening heartbeat tell me my kids are right where they're supposed to be. Or worse, they're not. I open the door slightly and peer through the dark. An ominous feeling wafts through the air and settles upon me, all-encompassing. Smoky black tendrils, like demon hands, curl and dance in the periphery of my vision, glide down my throat, and squeeze every fiber of breath from my being. I blink hard, and they're gone. An illusion brought about by a mind warped with fright. But the noise isn't. The chitter-chatter, pitter-patter whispers pierce straight through my gut. The sound unfurls through my veins and rattles my bones despite being so quiet in the dead of night. Something isn't right. The very air feels wrong. With limbs heavy as lead, I step into the hallway and force myself to the stairs. The sweat that beads on my forehead is like ice burning through my skin. The noise grates against my eardrums like nails on a chalkboard. I head down and watch for lights and shadows. With each step downward, I fall a thousand feet deep into the chitter-chatter, pitter-patter whispers, like I'm floating through space untethered. When I reach the landing, I stop and listen to the noise. The inner works of phantom whispers grow distinct as I make out individual sounds. A light tapping, rubbing against a glass window, glass or metal clinking, a child crying, screams, wails, chitter-chatter, pitter-patter, whispers. My eyes bulge and strain against the cage that is my skull as I glare into the dark. I jump with a start as lightning of every color flashes through the house. Green, purple, blue, orange, and red light cast prisms on the walls as lightning sizzles through the air. I turn towards the kitchen and my heart drops into the pit of my stomach. Dozens of glass bottles hang from my ceiling and cover the counters and dangle from the cabinet handles. I stumble and grab the kitchen island, also littered with glass bottles. Makeshift chandeliers cast twisted shadows through the quagmire that was once my kitchen. They're of all shapes and sizes, the likes of which I've never seen before. Green bottles olive-shaped, Blue bottles cylinder-shaped, brown bottles square-shaped. 
The chitter-chatter, pitter-patter whispers grow to a screech. The buzzing conundrum of cacophonous noise sounds like cries and pleas and warnings of impending doom. I have no clue how it got here, and I don't plan to find out. I turn to run back up the stairs. My best bet is to grab the kids and leave. For once, I hope Skyla is with that boyfriend of hers. Mommy? I stop dead in my tracks and whip around. Lightning flashes through the kitchen and casts a rainbow of light on every wall as my son's shadow appears before me. I yelp and reach for him, but grab nothing as lightning strikes again. The screeching grows. I frantically search through the dark for him. But his form has faded like sizzling bolts against the navy blue sky. I dart for the kitchen lights. Mom, help me. I swing around again, right in time to see Skyla's shadow dissolve like light into nothing. Skyla, I yell. I run towards where she once stood, but hit my head on a dangling yellow bottle. The sound of glass being wiped pierces through the screeching. I gaze into the bottle and my heart stops. A man, a pregnant woman, a young girl, entombed in the crystalline clutches of a pear-shaped bottle. The woman holds the young girl as she bangs on the glass, sobbing. The man blows his breath on the glass and begins to write. R. The chitter-chatter grows incessantly. U. The pitter-patter grates against my teeth. N. The whispers cause my blood to congeal and grow cold. I look up from the bottle. A man in baggy clothing with pitch black eyes, empty like a chasm, cocks his head in my direction. He splits his lips into a sickly grin and laughs. The ghastly laugh shoots through my veins and burns like venom. His entire being has molested my presence with his eldritch demeanor. He holds a green glass bottle in plain view, and the chitter-chatter, pitter-patter whispers dip into dead silence. Lightning flashes through the air. I close my eyes tight against the blinding light and scorching heat. I'm as heavy as lead, but as light as a feather as I'm whisked off my feet. My stomach churns, and my head spins, and when it stops, I open my eyes and look into a warped world through a vitreous, viridian-tinted veil. I look to my feet, where my kids are crouched on the glass bottom. I bend to comfort them as the chitter-chatter, pitter-patter whispers whisper a final word. Bear witness to the works of the glass man. I hope you enjoyed The Glass Man, as written by Kendra Yvette and performed by Justine Anastasia. On to our shows. Longtime resident Otis Jiry has his very own show here on our network, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, which you can hear every Sunday night. We also have Eric Peabody's Horror Hill, a podcast dedicated to some of our deeper and darker tales. We hope you check him out. And Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Fridays, featuring some southern down-home horror. And don't forget to check out the Fear from the Heartland archives, now featuring more than 120 episodes. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and please leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And also, follow us on Facebook, X, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark.
Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Chilling tales for dark nights.